we go. Hey, everybody, welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Kirby. And of course, we talked with people who are going to help our small and medium sized nonprofits do good better. And I guarantee you, you're probably looking at your calendar of things coming up, and there's probably an event on there. Well, wouldn't you like to have sort of a different perspective on how to make your events better? Really, what makes good event? You know, things that you've been doing for the last 25 years probably aren't working as well as they did 20 years ago. So we're going to talk about that today. And I've got a wonderful guest on. Uh, he is the uh, co-founder of uh, We and Goliath. Daniel Moss, welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. Thanks so much, Patrick. Great to be here. I'm super excited to chat today because event, this is what I cut my teeth on in the fundraising realm. This is what I obsess over uh, during event season and gala season. It's just like, how are we going to do something different and bigger and better? So I'm very excited to chat with you. But before we get into all of this, there's probably somebody on uh, sort of iTunes or Spotify or YouTube, and they're looking at you and they're looking at this topic and said, I want to learn more, but they don't necessarily know who you are. So if you can give a 5,000 foot view on who you are, what you do, and why we're talking today. You bet. So I'm a lead event strategist at We and Goliath. Um, we are a very strategic event agency. Uh, I, I have a background of about a little over 20 years in design, digital marketing, um, and events for nonprofits in particular, um, starting as a volunteer and then a workshop facilitator, then a lead marketing strategist and teacher trainer for a, a workshop based of, uh, nonprofit for 10 years, merged agencies with my co-founder who's um, got a degree in sustainable community development, background in design and, and events. So really what we're all about is like helping organizations host more meaningful, beautiful, bigger um, events that, that create better results. Um, I'm known as the optimizer. So got a tip and a tool for every challenge. And we were all about like, how can we optimize each aspect of your event, the design, the marketing, the interactivity, the production value, you know, and, and learn from the data to do it better next time. Mm -hmm. So we've been working with some amazing national nonprofits, um, international events, doing virtual galas, hybrid events, and uh, having a lot of fun, really. <laughs> uh, so I'm excited to talk to you about, yeah, how we can, how we can do better events that are more impactful. I love that. Um, we're going to start with a big question, and we're going to niche our way down to some tips and tricks that I think people can do. But I, I think when uh, the nonprofits look at their calendar, and they're seeing that gala at the end of the season, right? It's that fall gala. They got to make things uh, wonderful to set the table for really big gifts. I think before that, I think having the question answered on what makes a great fundraising event needs to be answered because there's a lot of different ways you can go with that. But I think there's probably, you've done enough of these in your career uh, to kind of get and set the table for if you're not doing these things, this could be uh, a little bit better. But what makes a great fundraising event? Mm -hmm. The most common fundraising event that, that we've been doing is celebration of a campaign that's already been going on a little mm -hmm. bit, okay? So you start out by really maximizing your relationships, right? That's where you raise the most money, let's be honest. Yep. Um, then the event is celebrating those donors and getting more donors, okay? So number one, don't expect to raise all your money live, right? It's a lead up. The event is almost like an excuse, right to do your campaign it's a celebration of what's already been raised of what you're achieving of what your goals are of why to trust you and then you cap off that fundraising campaign with the live fundraising at the event uh, we generally are doing these virtually over the last few years and what we find works best in a virtual fundraiser is a fully pre-produced event so it can be highly polished HD video, no mistakes, no errors, no internet issues, right? And it's worry-free, okay? Who doesn't want worry-free production at your biggest event of the year? Um, you can bring in all sorts of great graphics, custom designs, split screen layouts to, to let's say show B-roll video clips next to a speaker, right? Or have your two speakers side by side with, um, your custom logos and all that. So you want it to look really good, keep people's attention, tell great stories. You want a tight run of show, of course. It should you know, be very engaging. You can bring in as many elements as you want into a 
recorded event. Whereas if it's all live, very complicated to have you know, 20 segments in one hour, right? <laughs> most, most people wouldn't try to do that. But with our pre-recorded events, we've had as many as like four musicians throughout one hour, 10 different speakers across the hour, pre-produced segments, uh, promo segments, you know, screenshots of, of money raised. You can pack so much in. So I think that, and I, I think that's an important aspect. Don't, don't do like 20 minute speech or anything. Keep it really entertaining, look great, make it easy to donate and celebrate what's already been done while asking for that little bit extra to push you over the edge. So I love a I love a whole bunch of this stuff. Um, number one, I like that the concentration of like don't have the twenty minute speech. You know, break it off into little segments. People have the attention span of gnats. We all know that right now. Um, and so being very purposeful and sort of how I would react watching something on you know YouTube or something like it's got to be very very quick. What you said was really interesting though, and I think not a lot of nonprofits take this into consideration when they are doing events in the first place is they say, okay, we're going to have this event and we're going to raise all this money night of. I love what you've done is that you've sort of repositioned this to a celebration of all the hard work you did prior to the event and getting the excuse to party to say, hey, let's high five about all the work we did. Can you walk through that with me? Because I think you and I can really talk about the importance of everything you do in advance so that the event itself shouldn't be the pressure. The event itself shouldn't be the worry. It's all that heavy lift you've done months and months in advance, all the relationships you've curated. That becomes the event where this is the audio and visual fireworks, if you will, at the end of this long road. Kind of walk through why is that so important? Yeah, beautiful. Um, whether you're a large volunteer-based nonprofit and you want to activate your volunteers, in which case giving them a job to reach out to partners, sponsors, speakers, and attendees, an event is always a great way to do that. Or if you're a smaller nonprofit and you're really just working on high dollar donors and key relationships, still an event is a great way to energize your partners and sponsors because they're getting this great visibility. You have to have something to promise them that gives them some exposure, right? So the event is the excuse <laughs> to, to put on a really exciting fundraising campaign. And then as you're leading up to that, the promotion needs to start early and it gives you an excuse to talk about your message, right? If you just keep sharing your message without a focal point, people get tired. But if you're doing it because you're leading up to this big event and here's how you can get involved and here's why your money's urgent right now. Um, and you can talk to these awesome speakers at the event. You can ask questions in advance. You can send us a video clip and be included in the event, right? Like even letting your attendees sometimes have a face for even, you know, send us two words of why this is meaningful for you right now. And then you show 20 of them where they have a chance to ask a question on video. You're giving your attendees so many ways to get excited, so many ways to spread the word, invite their friends. Maybe your friend, maybe the friends of your attendees will be more excited to join an event rather than to just, um, you know, check out your website and donate. So a lot of opportunities in the lead up to the event to build on your relationships and build your attention, build up the need um, for your cause. What I love about this is that, we, you know, when we're talking about fundraising and everybody who listens to this show understands that we just constantly try to have touch points throughout the year, not just ask every time we have a conversation with a donor, right? If you pick up the phone and all you're doing is asking every single time you call, they're going to stop picking up the phone. What this does and this sort of system you're building is that you have touch points that lead up to the event that have nothing to do with solicitation, but is everything to do to sort of hype up the uh, the moment they build the excitement and everything kind of it. And I also love this idea of you work backwards from the goal that you want to set. It's the party to celebrate the thing. Okay, how do we hype it? Move backwards a couple of months. We start the pre prep or whatever. Okay, what do we need to do that? Well, we probably have to interview a bunch of people or have our sponsors on board, which means months prior to that, we have to have a game plan. So you start with the goal and work your game plan backwards rather than starting from whole cloth. We don't have a plan of what this is going to be. We probably need to invite some people and get some sponsors and then work forward. 
And this suggestion of this end game, the celebration piece that you get to do makes it a lot easier to digest if we're compartmentalizing our tasks prior to, so that we're just checking off everything leading up to it, which then you get to celebrate rather than worry. Beautiful. I love it. I love yeah. it. This sounds great. Uh, the other thing too, I love really like about this is that it sets the momentum tone mm -hmm. for afterwards. Yeah. Right. The, you, what you seem to be doing is setting the table for, or the, this is kind of the mindset we have to reshift on what the events could look like is that you're now building up this momentum. And then now what? You're going to mm -hmm. use this to go forward and talk to me a little bit about the advantages and or disadvantages, or maybe the, the pluses and minuses of doing an in-person live event or just or a live virtual event to a pre-recorded, right? So a lot of people will think, mm -hmm. Boy, I don't know, pre-recorded sounds a little, hey, you could just watch it on YouTube, right? That's, maybe that's kind of the thing. Like, I don't know why we need to do this. Give me the pros and cons of these things, because I think we need to uh, do a little better job of saying that each one of these has its benefits, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question of um, something that I think everybody should think about. Um, often they just default to live because they think it's easier or more engaging, but it's not necessarily. It can be <laughs> harder, more stressful and less engaging because you're not packing in as much fast moving edits and cuts or as many visuals. Um, and it's a lot more risky because when you have a lot of speakers, there's a greater chance that one of them is going to have an internet glitch, right, which can ruin a, a virtual event to some degree. So on the flip side, um, and here's the pros and cons, okay? You need a live event, a truly live event, if you have a high level of interaction with your between your speakers and your attendees. For example, a workshop, a training, right, a board of directors meeting, you know, with engagement from your attendees. Um, if all you're doing is live Q and A, it's probably not important enough to make the whole event live and and not have these other benefits. A pre-recorded event, like I mentioned, has so many benefits, in, including worry-free, higher quality, more mint elements, more visual polish. You know, you want to do that for your most important events whenever possible. Uh, it can make a big difference in a, a TV style quality, right? Um, impressing your audience, engaging, entertaining your audience is so important. And usually the audience interaction is limited in these big gala style events. Uh, so we've done 100% pre-recorded for all of our big galas, um, for the Urban League, for NARAL Pro-Choice America, for ERA Coalition, um, multiple annual events in a row because they've been very successful. I mean, um, over a million dollars raised in a single campaign for multiple events with those organizations. Um, it has to look great, you know, when it's your big event and it's replacing a very expensive polished gala event or some other in-person fundraiser, it has to look great. You can't just do a regular Zoom call and, and expect your sponsors to be happy, right? Yeah. Polish it up, step it up a notch, make it more powerful, more engaging, more wow level. Uh, and that's got to happen pre-recorded. Yeah, well, I, I love what you said about expectations, right? So for the last two and a half years, we've watched everything on Netflix and everything on Netflix is very highly produced. Therefore, when we see something, even though it might be an authentic conversation, and I think you can have authentic conversations or Q&As or li like live webinars, you can do that. And that's very great. But when you are talking about your biggest, bestest, and most awesomest donors and the ones who are sponsoring you, the expectation is we have invested a lot into this particular organization. Our celebration needs to be a, a reflection of the investment that we've made. And that's the expectation. If there was one of those things where you have the, uh, uh, it, uh, it, uh, 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 it ruins this sort of mental sort of like uh, enthusiasm that you have. So I love that as, a, as an expectations piece. And you mentioned sponsorship. Um, talk a little bit about the expectations of sponsorships and how it pertains to a pre-recorded event, because I think a lot of nonprofits are like, well, we need to mention them from the stage and we need to have that B-roll that's going on. Like there's a, it's, this drives me nuts. I mean, this could be an entire another podcast, note to self, going to do one, which is the um, typical sponsorship expectations. You can blow them out of the water 
with all the pre-recorded pieces. Am I am I wrong in this assessment? Totally agree. Um, also, let's just clarify that even a pre-recorded event can seem live to the yes. audience, right? Yes. We call it simu live, simulated yeah. live stream event. Okay, so you have got the red dot. It says it's live. We're streaming it in. It makes no difference. The attendees can join in all the same normal ways, whether it's in Zoom or on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, wherever you're hosting your event. Okay. In terms of the sponsor value, totally agree. So many more ways to bring it in in a pre recorded event. I mean, you can do most of the things we're talking about in a live event. It's just harder, more expensive, a little more risky. Um, but in a pre recorded event, you've got tons of time to plan out and build in, edit in graphics. Uh, conversations with your sponsors, promo videos from your sponsors about their services, um, maybe a ticker at the bottom or uh, logo sliders, name sliders at the beginning, at the end. And then of course, all the materials that go around the live event, like thank you emails and upcoming uh, preview emails and all of that. So yeah, I mean, you just can mix in anything you want into that pre-recorded event, split screen, full screen, and and, and give all the visibility that you need. Make sure that your, ha your sponsors are happy with it, right? They get to edit their, their short talk if needed. Like, oh, can you cut out that part? People appreciate that. Um, they get to spell check their names, right? I mean, it just means that everything is gonna be perfect. So that's why, that's why we do it for those really key events that don't need the, as long as you don't need your attendees to be on audio and video, consider a pre-record. Well, here's the other thing too. And I, I think nonprofits are like, well, if it's not live, we can't interact with our audience. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. I bet you have a couple of tips and tricks on how one would interact with our folks, even if it is not a live event. You, get, you bet, because it's simulated live. The attendees are there live. It's streaming in live. They're watching it for the first time. So here's a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, one is interact with them in advance about the live stream by asking for questions, either written audio or video, right? But in the live event, the main thing that you're doing is chat and polls, okay? So you can plan in your speakers to call on your attendees to chat with them, all right? And make it feel live. You can do that a lot. You can do it in micro questions, things like, um, what's the biggest challenge that you've had here? What's the biggest success that you've had as a volunteer in this area when you're doing this thing? I'd love to hear. And then everybody's benefiting from those answers live. Or just give me a plus sign if you feel me on what I'm saying right now. Or put in a fire emoji in the chat if you like what that speaker had just said. You want to keep doing that through your event to make it feel more live, to engage your audience, keep them entertained and, and talking to each other. But then take that a step further. We just did this 50th anniversary gala for the Equal Rights Amendment Coalition, and they had a live chat host for their event, a celebrity host. They yes. promoted it in advance, okay? So they did their event actually in two time zones. We, we did it simulated live at 7 p.m. PST and EST. They had a dedicated live chat host for East. Um, Alyssa Milano was that person for the PM event. So they promoted Great. the heck out of that in advance, right? Um, and another amazing uh, person in the, in the East Coast time. So that person is there live, chatting throughout the whole event, asking questions of the attendees and answering their questions throughout the whole event. You can also just have your speakers do that in a way that they can't do when they're live. Uh, of course, it ruins the simulated live thing to some degree. They know it's pre-recorded, but they're getting to talk to your speakers in a way more than they would get in a, in a five minute Q and A at the end where most people's questions don't even have time to be answered. Every question can get answered. 20, 30 questions can get answered instead of five uh, or more, right? And so that level of access to the speakers is, is really appreciated by attendees. Uh, and think how lively of a chat you will have if your speakers are there discussing, uh, your staff is there discussing, Everybody can be focused on the chat throughout the whole event because there's no work going in live in the pre-record. That's mm -hmm. the number one thing. But um, the, the way that you do that is very strategic. Are you doing it across Facebook and YouTube and Twitter? Are you having live tweeting going on and then maybe screen sharing? One thing we've done is like 95% live, but we overlay live social comments 
or live pledges in a donation event, or just the screen sharing the totals of your fundraising software in an otherwise fully pre-recorded event. So it it has that live excitement of pledges coming in, donations coming in, and we're giving, we're showing the names. That's a, a nice little polish to do. Mm -hmm. But um, just think about what questions do you want to ask your attendees during the event? What's going to excite them to feel engaged and, and really plan that into your script? You know, and part of this too is it doesn't have to be just a event. And so where I think a lot of nonprofits get uh, really hung up is like, well, I mean, it's, it's everything. This is, our th this is one of what you could do many. So let's just say you've got a bunch of questions that come in from a speaker that you've had. It's entirely acceptable to have a follow-up video recorded with the answers to all of the questions that didn't get addressed or were addressed in the pre-recorded stuff so that you listened to your audience. Hey, we're so excited. We had so much participation. We've decided to do another video to make sure that all the questions were answered. Click here. Brilliant. All of a sudden, you're engaging with them with not a solicitation, but you're giving them actual feedback in real time from those that you did. And you follow it up a week later to remind everybody what a kick-ass time they had watching your live event in the first place. And that doesn't take a lot of energy or effort at all. It just takes somebody to sit in front of this and answer the questions, record it for 25 minutes, upload it on YouTube, and all of a sudden, poof, you have a brand new event. That has nothing to do with fundraising, right? But it has everything to do with friend raising going forward. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Uh, another way that you could do that is do those Q and A's one at a time, so that yeah. you're getting a whole week or a month's worth of social yes. media content. Yes. Um, also, consider going live with those answers instead yep. of a pre-record in that case, because when you're when you're going live to Facebook, you, whatever your social media platform, you're going to get so much more organic traffic than a pre-recorded video upload. That's yep. just how the, the social media algorithms work, like four times as much visibility, I think, or, or potentially more, I'm forgetting. Um, plan out your question, make it succinct. You know, a little one minute answer is probably enough. A two minute answer, short videos do better often on social anyway. So if social is your main thing, this is like a gold mine of um, media content, uh, the, the unanswered questions list, because you're, you know that you're saying you're creating content that people want to hear. They just asked you about it. If one person asked you about it, probably 20 plus people want to hear about it. So that's um, not to be ignored from any event is that questions list. The other thing too is having everything pre-recorded is that you already have now a built-in follow-up uh, sort of like uh, if in case you missed it clips. So let's just say you've got 20 clips from the entire show. It's an hour show. You've got 20 clips, put it into like, you know, five minute little sessions. I'm not even sure if the math was right there, but let's just assume it is. And you can then put those up every, every other week or every week of like a segment of the actual event that maybe people missed live that mm -hmm. you can then repurpose and say, Hey, we had so much fun doing this portion of the event or check out this video that we played at the event. And now you get to re-engage people who thought it was awesome in the first place or mm -hmm. reach people who had no idea that you even existed or had an event in the first place. And they're really intrigued about it joining you next year. So That's there's absolutely it's, right. It's repurposing of the content thing is absolutely critical. I love all of those things. Um, I do a, uh, an excessive amount of MC work. And I'm always curious to see people's, uh, you know, so in the event production company on how important it is it to have a host, regardless if you're live or in person or, or doing it pre-recorded, how, how important is it to have a host that's sort of um, you know, shepherding you through this thing as if you would on stage? Is that something that you encourage? Is there a best practice for it? What does that look like? Oh, yes. Every event needs a host. Unless it's a panel discussion, then it needs a panel moderator, which is a host. Yep. Uh, you, you never just go from one segment to the other, to the other, to the other, without a consistent voice weaving your storyline throughout the event. And of course, as you know, that host sets the tone for the event. So Patrick, you obviously do such a great job of being a dynamic host, of being excited, and you're making me excited as a guest. And I'm sure you do that for your uh, event attendees. And that's such an important quality to have as a host. Somebody who's passionate about the subject, yes. Knowledgeable, yes. But are they entertaining? Are they engaging? Are they even funny? You know, you can't force funny. But if you can find somebody who's naturally funny, that's a, a huge bonus, right? Um, the ERA, again, because um, comes to mind, we just did their event last month and, and their whole subject is obviously very hot at the moment. Um, 
so they got uh, a uh, actress, a movie star from Sister Act to be their host. And she was super funny, the whole event. I mean, it's and reproductive rights are an issue that is not, or just women's rights in general, that, that's kind of serious usually. But to add a little humor into a tough subject lightens up the mood and lets people be more vulnerable, more enjoying. Uh, so definitely a host is so important. Definitely get a good host, whether it's a an active donor, right? Like maybe look for a celebrity donor if you have one, somebody in your in your network who's got some name recognition so they can build up attendance, but at least most important, somebody who's gonna just guide an engaging conversation, stay away from a monotone voice and you'll be golden. Well, and I think another one of those things too is that if the tone changes throughout the night in a pre-recorded sort of event that you're putting on live, you can make sure that you have already recorded the tone that you want to set the table, right? So if you're having a serious uh, sort of issue, you've got a speaker that comes up that's very emotional, you don't want to come out of it like, that was great talking about their abortion. Like that's sort of like a, that's a terrible thing to do. So you can actually make sure that you have the tone that you want as an organization to set you up for maybe the ask saying, hey, go on your phones and click on this QR code to give as much as you possibly can. And that tonality, I think, is super important. And I'm so appreciative of you uh, bringing it up. And if you don't have a cele celebrity, get an influencer from your community. Get your mm -hmm. local uh, radio station host. Get your local TV person. Get somebody who maybe be an up and cominger that might be really interesting or somebody connected to the cause is super important. And I think a lot of people are very worried about just the general hiccups that might happen at a live event. But there's probably a handful of things that happened during a pre-recorded event that you have experienced that said, you know what? This wasn't the best thing that we should have done in the first place. And are there a couple of things that you can say from your experience to avoid in the virtual uh, event things that, that just have not worked, that shouldn't work, or things that you may want to reconsider while you're planning an event? Mm. Well, in a live event, you want to, number one thing is ensure that your speakers have an ethernet cable. Okay, that is the number one tip for a live speaker to have not just fast internet, but reliable internet, okay? Wi-Fi is great, it's very fast, it's, it's fast enough, it's very convenient, but it's not as reliable as you think, okay? So an ethernet cable will guarantee no major internet hiccups, it's only about $10, just buy them for your speakers if you don't think your speakers have them or will get them, and you may need a little USB hub because a lot of recent computers don't have an ethernet port. That's our number one tip. Um, but you know, for presentation style, don't read off a script. That's my other number one tip for like engaging speakers. Ask your speakers, only have an outline, okay? Also arrange that outline under the webcam because even if you have an outline, but you're looking down, nobody wants to see your forehead while you're talking or looking at your phone, okay? So if you have paper, tape it to the screen or computer notes, put it right under the webcam, okay? So no foreheads, um, don't look up people's nostrils, right? If You have to elevate your webcam to eye level. Don't have that super low, no shaky video, no holding phones, no vertical footage, right? Um, avoid echo, avoid background noise, a lot of these are very obvious. Um, avoid un and you know, twenty-minute talks, right? You got to keep people keep people's attention with a switch up as as often as possible. Um, avoid super text-heavy slides, PowerPoint slides, right? Like learn from TED talks. What do they have on their slides? Usually, like a few words at a time, a big picture, right? People often forget to include pictures um, or jokes in their PowerPoints. It's, uh, it's very important. Add emotion, add humor. Mm -hmm. So those are some of our, our main tips for, those really apply for live or pre-recorded. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think yeah. presentations in general, and I think that's where I think people get really hung up on the virtual events or online stuff is they're like, okay, well, I got to redo everything I've ever known about presenting. No, it's the same thing, right? I think that's mm -hmm. where like, I'll go to do something different. No make eye contact with the screen, first of all. So make sure that that camera thing is really important. And I've also uh, always tried to tell people who are doing presentations or speaking is find something where you can stare at yourself in the screen so that you can see your own face as you are presenting, right? It's the same way that you would rehearse in a bathroom. You're like trying to, you know, de-stress yourself out from giving a presentation. Well, make sure that, that people can see or that you can see your own reaction so that you don't have that resting face that everybody is really fearful of, that you can actually smile and, and sort of uh, emote the motion that you want to project 
that you can see it the entire time, which I think is super important. And then really, and I think you scratched the surface on it, sound is the most important thing that you can get right in a presentation. People can forgive little hiccups here and there from a visual standpoint. They cannot forgive the sound. Can't mm -hmm. hear and ask, nobody will give you money. Make sure you kind of do those things too. It's really important. Um, are you going to see an end of virtual or online events, even though you know we sort of see the end is near when it comes to a pandemic? Or are we seeing the new norm of events going forward? I think it's clear virtual is here to stay because all of our clients, they're coming to us saying, you know, we tried, we wanted to go back in person, but our attendees are asking us not to. They loved the convenience of joining from home. We love the cost savings, the environmental benefit of not having to fly people. I mean, there's so many benefits. So everybody is basically saying we want to either stay virtual or go hybrid. Um, when you do a hybrid event, you're, you're getting the best of, best of both worlds if you do it well, but of course it's complicated. And those audio issues are the number one thing to avoid. You need a good company who knows how to do the mix minus with the audio, make sure that you're not getting echoes, make sure that speakers on stage have the right audio inputs coming in for virtual speakers or questions from the audience. I mean, there's a lot of things to think through there. The costs are 50 to 100% higher than a regular in-person event to do a, an online hybrid event. So you can't always afford that. But what you can do is put virtual events between your big hybrid event or your in-person events. So you can, because you can do them more often. They're so much more affordable. They let you do more events and reach a, a larger audience. I would say if you have a national or international um, cause, interest, right, subject, there's no reason that you should be ignoring virtual anymore because our clients that they've seen like 2X, 5X, 7X attendance by going virtual after four years or 10 years of a conference, uh, who wouldn't want that kind of benefit, especially if your costs are much, much less, which they usually are. So. Mm -hmm. Well, not only the cost for you, the uh, uh, nonprofit organization or the conference planner, but for the people who have to fly across the country or across the globe to get to the conference in the first place. And so you're helping them who, you know, when you're talking about trying to be as inclusive as possible, that's another thing that I think we really don't hammer enough in the virtual mm -hmm. event environment is you're allowing for anyone, regardless yeah. of their ability to be there or, uh, or sort of a visual you know, I'd, I'd maybe love to talk a little bit about that. Uh, where does that live in your uh, brain when you're sort of cultivating some of these virtual events is, you know, are you thinking about individuals with vision impairment or hearing impairment? Mm -hmm. And what, what sort of resources do you suggest yeah. or provide that allow this inclusivity that you might not have ever had before if you're especially doing it as an in-person or hybrid only event? Beautiful. Uh, that is an under discussed point. So, um, the accessibility on the cost side, because you have very little to no incremental cost for att additional attendees for most virtual events, you can make your events free. If they weren't, you could have a free ticket or a scholarship ticket for an otherwise paid event. Um, so obviously the travel costs, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great benefit to, to be able to reach people who you couldn't reach financially otherwise. And then on the accessibility level, uh, yes. So also much cheaper than an in-person event to offer closed captioning. It starts at free with Zoom AI or YouTube AI captions. Uh, so you're reaching the vision impaired that way. But you can, um, on a, another benefit of a pre-recorded event is you can, you can do, I would say, um, captioning a pre-recorded video versus live human captioning is almost 10 times cheaper. Okay. So yeah. you get a, a professional transcript you embed it in your simulated live event and it's 100% accurate. Whereas the AI transcription is only around 80% accurate and it's kind of painful if people have bad accents or they're talking too fast or something at 70% you know, accuracy is not fun to read if that's your primary thing. So another benefit for the pre-record. But then you can also bring in uh, ASL. Mm -hmm. That's um, an important aspect for reaching full accessibility. You can do platform translation. 
Uh, we've, we did one event for two UN agencies around migrant workers' rights in four languages of live human trans, uh, interpretation and web full platform translation and graphics translation. So um, we've done six languages for a USAID funded election security event. I mean, these events are reaching over a hundred countries and getting, like I said, about five times the attendees for that UN event that they were getting for four years before. Of course, they're gonna stay virtual. I mean, we're talking about doing their, their next year's event right now. And they're gonna keep doing it in multiple languages because the costs are so much less than than inter in person interpreters. They used to fly interpreters um, to their events. Mm -hmm. So, so much that you can do to make your events more affordable, uh, more accessible for vision impairment and hearing impairment. Uh, major benefit. Yeah, no, I, I love that, and I think that's again, like you said, it's not being discussed enough. I think when we're talking about the inclusivity of some of these things, that there's are such a benefit, and that so many more individuals who want to give, who want to participate, who want to make a difference in this world, depending on you know who you have as as, as your biggest supporters in your no, your nonprofit, they want to help. But if you're not giving them the ability to participate in some of the biggest things that you're putting on, well, then you're not you know, uh, you're missing out on some amazing talent that might be on the sidelines because you haven't gotten that in the first place. And I think maybe some of the uh, people who are listening are like, well, this sounds great. Daniel, this sounds great if I'm a multinational organization doing amazing big things. But we're just a small little shop. We're a medium-sized shop. I don't know if, you know, pre-recorded or the virtual event thing is for me because we just have a bunch of local folks here. What would you say to that? Yeah, yeah. Um... Of course, we're pulling out all the bells and whistles more for national organizations, meaning custom graphics, animation. Um, those are the most and interpretation. Those are some of the most expensive things. We do have that that premium production option. But for um, more local organizations, we still recommend pre-records. We just do more professional instead of premium production. So what that means is maybe it is a Zoom call that we're pre-recording but everybody we know has their ethernet cable there and we can make edits if there is a mistake and we can still add in some B-roll afterwards or do, do different things. There are still benefits when you're doing that, but usually we're not using Zoom because Zoom highly compresses the video. So use other tools, special like podcast and pre-recording software that, that uploads the video after the recording, mm -hmm. okay? So it doesn't require a fast internet and that's the main quality difference that you see, the video is just much better. So if, if you have a smaller budget, you're not gonna probably get custom animation, custom illustration, maybe you don't, maybe do your own graphics instead of hiring the agency, but you probably still wanna talk to an agency about getting the technology done, getting the interactivity strategy right, getting your promotion in place, um, and then doing some video editing, getting the live streaming. There's some key elements there that are pretty affordable and take a lot of stress off your hands. You don't need to be the expert in all this virtual event technology. You just focus on your content and your community. And then that time is very valuable, right? You want to think about your opportunity costs of having to have somebody learn to be your virtual event expert in your staff. Maybe that becomes their full-time job, but what would they be able to accomplish if they were doing their actual job? <laughs> exactly. No, I love that. And again, I always think of this as an opportunity for smaller and medium sized shops to expand your audience. If you don't, if your main concern is not enough people know what you do or who you are, well, why wouldn't you want to go and blast this out to as many people as possible? What if there are people in other surrounding communities that don't know your event is going on or they can't get to your event, right? We live in the middle of nowhere, North Dakota. It is cold here nine months out of the year. It snows apparently like eight out of months, uh, months out of the year now, right? Traveling across the state to get to your event is a near impossibility in the middle of winter, but everybody can log on and watch this event, which means your audience has the potential to grow, like you said, three times, five times, seven times as large, because you put no restrictions on showing up to something in the first place. And that's the brilliance and the genius of doing some of these events. And why I agree with you 100% that these are never going to go away. In fact, I think people will double down on it. In fact, this will be the norm in a long uh, time where you're going to get into this metaverse and things that are coming down the future that I'm sure you're thinking about clearly. Uh, that is going to be the important thing to consider while you are trying to grow your nonprofit, which leads me to believe 
that a boatload of people are going to want to get a hold of you, Daniel, because they're going to want to pick your brain about all the awesome things that you're doing at the events, but they don't necessarily know where to go. Where can people get a hold of you and learn more about we and Goliath? Thank you, Patrick. So please uh, don't be shy. Reach out to us if you want a strategy session. I'll personally get on the phone um, or on a Zoom. We'll discuss all your event ideas, your needs, your goals, what, what challenges you've had. You can pick my brain about your particular situation. Uh, I love helping nonprofits with your event strategy. So you can reach us at weandgoliath.com. Just shoot us a message on the site or an email and schedule a virtual event strategy session. Uh, it's a, something that we're doing for free right now uh, with you know me, you're the co-founder, lead strategist. You're not just filling out a form and getting a quote. Like We're offering a lot of time to really brainstorm with you. So take us up on that offer while it's there. We are really proud to win five Eventex awards this year for virtual event production. Mm -hmm. And you want to benefit from that kind of uh, you know, a hands-on agency, somebody who really cares about nonprofits, understands them, knows how to grow a cause, make things more inspiring, more interactive, more beautiful, better attended. Uh, don't just trust your most important event to a software company. They're going to give you a junior level um, person who doesn't really care as much, who's not allowed to spend as much time with you as, as we are, because they have too many clients, they're overburdened, right? So those are the main reasons why you would want to consider an agency like us that, that really gives you the time and the, the kind of white glove service that you need for your most important events to succeed. Find people who are as enthusiastic as the events as you are putting them on. I think we found one for you and Mr. Daniel Moss. So get a hold of uh, him immediately. So after the podcast, go to the show notes. We put all this information in there. So it makes it easy for you while you're clicking around. By the way, if you haven't subscribed to this podcast, what the heck is wrong with you? This is the type of conversation we get to have every single week with brilliant people like Daniel. That deserves a five-star review. This is a five-star guest, dang it. And then immediately go back to the show notes. Click on uh, We and Goliath and go get a hold of Daniel and his crew and really think differently about doing your events. And again, put this as part of your fundraising strategy. Don't let this go by the wayside and just continue doing the things you've always been doing. We know we are annoyed by that thing on this podcast. Uh, Daniel, thanks so much for what you do. Thanks so much for your enthusiasm on events. I really do appreciate it. It's something that I've been passionate about for a while. It's fun to talk with somebody who is uh, equally as passionate about these kind of things, but thank you so much even more so for being a guest here on the official Do Good Better podcast. You're awesome, Patrick. This was a really fun conversation. Super interesting. Thank you, everybody. Hope that was useful. And Appreciate it, my friends. Soon.